The roll. Mayor Baker. Here. Deputy Mayor Van Ness. Here. Councilmember Smith. Here. Councilmember Sperry. Here. Councilmember Curtis. Present. Councilmember Herbig. Here. Councilmember Danuski. Here. Thank you. Um, and just a little housekeeping, we are adjourning the executive session. Um, if you'll please stand. And Derek, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, very much. So I don't know, our mics really seem to be bum buzzing tonight, so maybe we just need to turn them off if we're not actually using them. So, um, All right, next item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. If there are no changes or additions or objections, the agenda will stand approved as written. Next item on the agenda is citizen comments. This is an opportunity for you to express your views on issues that are important to you in the community. And we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes, please. Um, your Honor, if I could also clarify something. Um, for each of the public hearings, the citizens will have the opportunity to give their public their comments on those particular topics as well. Right. So the, right now is not the only opportunity to give public comment. All right. Um, with that, will the clerk please call the first person? Noel Burnett. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Noel Barnett, and uh, I get my address as well as that correct. 420 Southwest 11th Avenue in Canby, Oregon. I work for CEMEX. Um, I'd like to just touch base first of all and uh, comment on the consent agenda item C, the interlocal agreement that's being voted on this evening. Um, all that we'd like to do is it's, if it ends up passing tonight, um, on behalf of CEMEX, all we ask is uh, moving forward uh, when it's implemented is anytime there is a complaint or uh, notification that the city receives that there's an issue potentially with odor related to our facility, we just ask that we get no we are notified as quickly as possible, just as a courtesy, because uh, if we don't know there's an issue, then you know we can't help to correct it. So um, we just like to take that in consideration. That would really help us out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barnett. Janet Hayes. I had this all planned. <laughs> okay. Janet Hayes, 6303 Northeast 181st, Kenmore. Um, I want to address the issue of the light rail that we've seen written about in the uh, Bothell Kenmore Reporter. And They're running it, the, what I understand, they're running it under the um, rapid transit. When you ask, answer the questions on the survey when you are voting for rapid transit, which was part of what R Rob had told me, is you are voting for other means of transportation other than what we have. So that is lumped in with it. And, I don't know if you knew that. I called at Sound Transit and they said that is all part of rapid transit. So I have read and studied this and found that the loading station, in fact, will be here in Kenmore. Where? Does anyone have an idea who has the truth? My observation and experience is, is we, the folks that all live in Kenmore, have learned to navigate around the traffic of 522 to get to our destinations here, to the post office, drugstore, grocery store, library, doctors, etc., we stay here. The majority of users, most are just passing through on their way to work. Commuters traveling to Seattle, Bellevue, Kirkland, 405 and back. The light rail plan station will bring vehicles from Lake Forest Park 
Montlake Terrace, Shoreline, Friar, Linwood, Bothell, Alderwood Manor, Totem Lake, University of Washington, out uh, Bothell, to the station in Kenmore, traveling on our back roads and through our neighborhoods. That's where I got waylaid. I, d I don't know where I am now. But that, that basically is the point I want to make, that I'm not understanding, if you'll give me just one moment, why a study hasn't been done on tolling strictly 522 between Lake Forest Park 145th and 405, instead of burdening the community with a light rail project and all the traffic that that will in entail. If we had that, I, I'm, I can guarantee you that we're not going to have the amount of traffic we do now. Um, somehow we have to figure something that will work for the community. Having people arrive here to ride the right rail is problematic. Will we be all parking lots for them? Where are we going to house this loading station? Because literally that is where it's planned. The stop between here, Lake Forest Park, and Bothell. So if you know anything and I don't, would you please let me know and the rest of the citizens what's maybe in the plans so we can make the very best out of a very bad situation. I know I can get all over Kenmore with no problem. I know every little back street. I don't have to use the highway. My husband does. But there is no light rail down to Bellevue, so there'll be people catching it and going to 405 and getting on a bus. So we'll have so much traffic. It's just, it needs to be addressed. And I don't know why, for the first time, maybe we can strike out and do something different and have a toll here in Kenmore for that and use the excuse of the lake and the environment and what we have here will be absolutely no chance of turning back. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hayes. Yes. Richard Honor. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Richard Honor. I live at 192164th Place, Northeast Kenmore. Um, thank you for being our council. Um, I have an issue that I have not made any preparation for, but I'll do it in two minutes. <coughs> About 100 yards from here, there's 183rd. I've lived here for 35 years, and I've seen so many near-death situations on that street that I tremble still, because Friday again, with the minivans and the cars parked on both sides of the street, and the two-year-olds and three-year-olds <laughs> running across the street, driving at five miles an hour is absolutely threatening to the children that live in this project behind us. I've tried to think what would solve the problem. Could it be white lines? Could it be blinking lights? Could it be a traffic officer? Could it be education for moms with all these little kids? I don't know what it is. It's very narrow, very congested, but a couple of times during the day, almost every day of the week, these children are running in and out of the driveways of the trailer park, back and forth across the street because their parents park on the other side. I don't know how to solve it. I'm worried about it. Public health and safety is, it must be our number one concern, including the people who live right here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Honor. Kate Donaldson. Patrick O'Brien. Oh, sorry. I'm here. Okay. I have nothing planned, but my name is Kate Donaldson, and I live at 6401 Northeast 181st Street in Kenmore. And I can't believe how bold I am. I'm standing here with no, nothing printed in front of me. This is really um, amazing. And bold, I mean, look at me. 
Can you see me? Um, I guess I, it's, it's always the same. I sound like a broken record. It's the, the see next. I love you guys. I do. You, I love Noel. He's great. Um, and just everything that's going on down at the waterfront has gotten to a pace that is, well, it's just out of control. It is, um, it's just not livable. And what I'd like to do is work with you all somehow to come up with a solution. And I don't know, I know what I think it should be, but I want, it'd be nice if we could all work together on this. And have you done anything like a public forum or a, some sort of, um, you know, council members with public um, just conversation about it? Um, doesn't have to be formal. In fact, it'd be better if it wasn't formal. Um, so that's that's what's been on my mind. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Patrick O'Brien. Patrick O'Brien, six three three zero Northeast one hundred eighty first Street, and I will. Totally vote 100% with what Kate just said. Uh, there was a, a number of us that live in Kenmore that met with Kiwit General prior to the start of the support work done on the 520 bridge. We met at Tully's. We had a very long conversation, and we got every promise in the world, but the hours of operation were, uh, weren't going to work on weekends, and I can have any number of people that were at that meeting collaborate that. We've also gone to Cal Portland directly and had conversations with them. And one gentleman shoved me in the meeting because, you know, I like to say what I'm not supposed to say, maybe. I, I tell them the truth and they don't want to hear it. But the real reality of this is, is that I've been calling 911, the state patrol, the uh, state attorney general, and the attorney general for the United States for action against Cal Portland and the asphalt plant. They're in direct violation of state law when it comes to hours of operation. They're in direct violation of noise ordinances, both state and local. The 911 operator, at the instruction of someone from city council, has instructed the police chief not to respond to my requests that they be cited. I've inquired in how to go about doing a citizen's arrest or, or a citizen's uh, notification of violation. That's all been blown out and ignored, and it's really time to, to look at this and, and address this. We have hours of operation. Sometimes I, I get up at 1.30 in the morning and I'll follow the concrete trucks, not to a Washington uh, Department of Transportation site, but to a hole in the ground in downtown Seattle, where one morning at 1.30 in the morning, 40 cement trucks were lined up with a chemical feed truck there pumping some chemical into the concrete, and it went on all night. And that's not the only time that happens. And we're sick of it. You can't develop a downtown. You can't have 500 new residents in the, in the senior housing putting up with that. The noise is more than just mice running around. There's a large crash to start the process off. The boiler at the cement plant starts, and trucks are going in and out. And then you have front-end loaders going beep, beep, beep. And there's no place for us to go. It's constant. It's repetitive. And no amount of normal complaining has done a thing, including calling Simex themselves. I've done that and said, you know, why don't you just disconnect the, the backup signals on your, on your uh, front end loaders? But it's a horrendous problem, and you really need to do something about it because you, you will never develop downtown Kenmore with that going on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. I believe this is A. Nooney. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Elizabeth Mooney, <laughs> M O O N E Y, 5934 Northeast 201st. I haven't met you before, but hi. I saw you on the video 
thanks to Nigel getting on the video when I was in Utah. And so I met the new council member, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. I'm, so I don't have enough time to explain all my thoughts, but I do want to go back to a metaphor maybe. If you look at a chess board, and I'll try this on you, there are pawns and there's the king, and to win, you get the king. I also, like Kate, I know Noel, and he was there for us when we were complaining about Semex. I don't know if Cal Portland is here, but I know Patrick O'Brien was mentioning cement trucks. I don't know who the king is that we are trying to get at. I wish I knew, but I know that back in 2011, that's when I was told the Joint Transportation Committee, led by Senator Mary Margaret Haugen, who we were in collaboration with here at this city, that they were, they were identifying our North Lake Washington, the Lake Point property, specifically as industrial. That is what caused this problem. The fact that Semex started churning out more asphalt fumes in an unmonitored old 1973, and I sent you an email about that, facility that will not get monitored because they're grandfathered in. You know why they're grandfathered in? Brent Smith, you don't know, and you don't know, because you didn't vote for it. Because the rest of the council, and Nigel, you don't know. The rest of the council with Debbie Bent and Fred Stouter were the staff members that were in charge at the time, and the council supported Cal Portland adding the word manufacturing. That's how I see it. If I'm wrong, great. But I have never heard from the council members that are still here why they voted. Sorry, it's just true. I have never heard an email back from you. I've heard from Eric Admin. I've heard from Debbie Bent about the peer. But they can increase their peer and their business without upgrading the facility, which will still churn out non-monitored asphalt fumes. And they're being fingered tonight, and yes, I think you should pass the ordinance because you've got to start somewhere. But the culprit for our health problems is not necessarily Semex, who has been here for years and years, along with Cal Portland, along with Lake Point, along with Gary Sargent and Pioneer Twing, along with WashDOT, along with KGM, and mind you, our city supported that Lake Point property turning into the 520 project because Senator Mary Margaret Haugen took all the, including Ruth Kagey from over in Lake Forest Park, who told me they had identified this part, Kenmore's part of Lake Washington, as industrial. I object to that. That's why I ran against you, Alan Benes. You suck in the fumes. I want you to complain to Tom Hudson at Puget Sound Clean Air. But really, the problem is deeper and you've got to go further than Semex. And they, as far as I understand, from that meeting that we had, and I know I'm going a little bit over here, but Patrick O'Brien and I and Derek Poon, who do Dr. Baker knows, we went and, and met with a guy named Mark Baker, who's the one who pushed Patrick O'Brien. The point is, my understanding, and I'd like to meet with Semex after this, is that they are not who we need to talk to. It's Cal Portland who has lobbied for more cement, and are we going to be the host for all the transportation? I don't want to. I'd rather be healthy. It's your policy. Thank you, Mr. Mooney. There's no one else signed up. Um, Mr. Barnett, thank you for your comments. Mrs. Hayes, um, yeah. This is only a study. There will be no rail built in my lifetime, and I would venture to guess just about everybody's lifetime in this room. This is planning only, and that's all it was ever intended to be. And um, there, you're probably looking at a ballot measure in 2030 or 2040. So, uh, yeah, and so as far as a station, nobody has a clue. The route, nobody has a clue. We're asking people to study it. That's what that's all about. Um, Mr. Honor, I think I understand your, your concerns, but that's 182nd Street, not 183rd. 
Yeah, so I just wanted to correct you on that. But yes, we understand your concerns with the kids running in and out of the street, and we have lowered the speed limit, we have reduced parking requirements on that street, and we're aware of, aware of the issues. Uh, Mrs. Donaldson and Mr. O'Brien, um, thank you for your comments. And Ms. Mooney, I just sent you an email again explaining why Ecology asked for that change to go in. So uh, I have sent that email to you one more time. So thank you very much for your comments. Next item on the agenda is uh, the consent agenda. And um, I'm wondering if we want to pull item C. Yes, I'll second that. Yeah. So uh, then uh, uh, the chair will entertain a motion to uh, approve the uh, consent agenda minus item C. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the consent agenda mi minus item C say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> the uh, consent agenda minus item C stands approved. Item C. Um, Mr. Hampson. I think we we only have a couple of questions. Good evening, Council. Councilmember Smith, do you have uh, anything, yes. anything in particular? Yeah, I would just like to know what is the process for notification. As the gentleman from CMEX noted, um, that I, I, I'm assuming by his comment they are not notified. It would be reasonable that. They would be not only so that they're aware of the infraction, but also so maybe they can remedy it as it happens. And I'm just curious what the process is, and do we notify them? During the initial six-month trial period, the process wasn't for the city to notify them. We were basically just taking the reports and turning it over to Puget Sound Clean Air Agency. Uh, since then, and after meeting with um, CEMEX, we agree with you that it's um, real. Um, it's okay to notify them. So we're going to. Notify them via a method that we talk about, either via, uh, um, email or a phone call, when we get a complaint. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for uh, taking care of this. And I appreciate the data that you gave us about the six-month trial, about that you received 13 complaints and were able to respond to nine. Uh, because the other four were after hours. Um, so can you tell me if somebody has a complaint, w what do they do? They, do they call 911 like we've heard here tonight, or how do, how do people call to get uh, to notify the city of this situation? During the cooperative odor complaint um, program with Puget Sound Clean Air Agency, people are directed to call the city uh, reception desk directly, and she will in turn um, contact the appropriate person to respond to it. Perfect. Okay. Any other questions? No. All right. So item C is still out there. So the chair accepted the motion to uh, accept item C on the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any turn, further turn, discussion? Your mic, turn your mic on. Any other further discussion? All those in favor of approving item C, say aye. 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 Opposed? The yeah, item C stands approved unanimously. Next item on the agenda is a public hearing and discussion of new regulations for heavy manufacturing businesses and amending and updating Title V business licenses and regulation. Mr. Hampson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And as you mentioned, this is a public hearing to discuss new regulations for heavy manufacturing businesses. and. Um, during this process, we also took a look at the uh, Title V, our business registration, or excuse me, our business license um, chapter. Uh, but back in, back on March 16th, 2015, council directed us as staff, city manager, to explore new rules and regulations for heavy, or the negative impacts on heavy manufacturing businesses within the, within the city of Kenmore. The uh, five topics that we um, took a look at were one requiring all trucks leaving the uh, heavy manufacturing businesses to cover their loads. Two is to establish a business and occupational tax for have heavy manufacturing businesses. Three was establish a regulatory business license for heavy manufacturing businesses. Four was to establish maximum noise levels and hours of operations for heavy manufacturing businesses. And five was to establish a public nuisance and odor regulations for heavy manufacturing businesses. 
So regarding our item number one, what we found out that there's uh, state laws that address uh, covering, trucks covering their loads. And uh, this law allows truck beds with more than six inches of freeboard to operate with co without covers. And any city ordinance requiring a truck cover where there are more than six inches of freeboard board argu arguably would be preempted by state law. So it's our recommendation not to pursue additional ordinance on, on this matter. Item number two is a business and occupational tax. Um, we are still continuing to look into and investigate this and want to bring this back to you after the summer break sometime in the fall. Item three, the regulatory business license. Uh, we took this, up, as I mentioned, we took the opportunity to look at all of Title V and um, what we did was eliminated unnecessary licenses and terms to make them more um, consistent with the rest of the code. So we, we, we revised the title of tap, Chapter 5, or Title 5, to be Regulatory Business License and Registration because we were having a lot of people um, confused about what the difference is between a regulatory license and a business registration program. So we're trying to help clarify that through that change. Um, similarly to the rest of the code changes or other similar code changes we've done over the past few years, uh, we're trying to italicize um, defined words. So anytime there's a defined word, it just gets italicized so people who are reading it will know that they can go to the definition to find a definition for the word. Um, also, in a line, to be in line with the rest of the code uh, provisions, we're changing the responsible person to the city manager or his or her, her designee. It makes it a little bit more easier if you're having you know, staff level who are responsible for um, a particular uh, item. Um, if you're going to change that responsible person, uh, you, or you might change their title too, just to leave it as the city manager, his or her designate. Um, in addition to, we added the new heavy manufacturing chapter, which is 5.10. Um, and this uh, essentially requires a uh, heavy manufacturing business to obtain a regulatory business license and to comply with the uh, provisions of the rest of the code. It's pretty minimum, but that's essentially all it is. Uh, our recommendation uh, for that business license, if we pursue it, is a $200 fee, which is really similar to all the other uh, regulatory licenses in our current fee schedule. And if we need to, we can revise our fee schedule the next time we bring that back to you. Additionally, we removed unnecessary licenses such as closeout sales, dances, go karts, and outdoor music events, amusement parks, carnivals, and racetracks. Most of this stuff was brought over when we adopted the uh, King County Code, so it just didn't make sense for the city of Kenmore. We do have the opportunity if we have those types of um, um, events that we can regulate them through a special event permit. Um, we had some concern about the, what we were calling massage businesses. Um, they're called massage parlors in the code, and I think that's an old term, and so we changed the term to massage businesses. Um, and we also added food trucks to be exempt from a business license. So currently they are required to get a business license. It's a no fee uh, license, but they do have to do um, some application and review process. Moving on to item number four, which was a noise levels, levels and hours of operation. Um, so what we did here was we took a look at other um, cities, um, ordinances and rules and try to be consistent with what we're seeing other jurisdictions that have. Um, so it turns out the state Department of Ecology has a set, set minim, or maximum level of noises based on types of businesses. And what we've done was set with our proposal is set a um, requirement that heavy manufacturing business would have to comply to those state maximum noise levels that are established by Department of Ecology, and that's measured at the heavy manufacturing business property line, and so they wouldn't have to go on to the receiving property um, and take measurements. And so there's a little bit difference there between that and the state law, but um, that's how ours is written. And in addition to that, the hours of operation Department of Ecology also has set hours of operations, and I think it's um, 10 or, or um, 6 a.m. 
It's actually 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. But we are recommending a 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays for noise in excess of the Department of Ecology set maximum levels um, from, from business, heavy manufacturing businesses. So, Brian, um, my understanding is currently you've got the ecology rules, and the if somebody were to, I mean, the only person that would enforce those would be the Department of Ecology currently. Is that correct? Correct. So by folding this into the city code, we are giving ourselves the ability to then enforce. Correct. Okay. Thanks. So moving on, and yes, after I get done, there will be a public hearing, so the public will have the opportunity to comment, too. Um, regarding item number five, in addition to the noise levels and hours of operations, our recommendation is a public nuisance and odor regulation. And so this is a little bit different. It's just regulated on a nuisance level. And it's similar to the, uh, the, the maximum noise levels established by Department of Ecology, but this is essentially that it's not allowed to happen during those uh, hours of um, 6 a, um, 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. on Monday through Friday, and 9, 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. And that's really the all that I have to um, explain on the public hearing. Questions? Councilmember Smith. Thanks, Brian. I'm going back to question one, uh, or item one, on the covering of loads. Um, in the RCW that's quoted, it, it refers to it as a paved public highway in that RCW. And what I'm wondering, and I understand the argument to not require it on the highway, but does that preclude us from a city to regulate what happens on our own streets? I may have to ask the uh, city attorney to weigh in, but I was talking to the police chief, Chief Sather, about this, and he says that he is, uh, he is allowed to enforce this um, RCW on any of our city public uh, right-of-way streets. Okay. I can ask that question. Yes. Under state law, uh, the definition of highway includes uh, city streets and roads. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, City Attorney, if you could please uh, clarify something for me. My understanding is we can be stricter than state law. We can't be more lenient than state law. That's correct. Then why can't we be more strict on covered loads? On which? Covered loads. <laughs> there's a difference between being more strict where there's levels of or standards like noise levels or pollution, uh, what do they call it, parts per million or things like that, versus preemption, which is if the state allows something to happen, we can't make that exact thing not happen. We cannot prohibit what state law allows and vice versa. Okay. So the proposal was, as I understand it, to require trucks that have more than six inches of freeboard to cover their loads. No, just all trucks covered loads. Oh, all, all trucks, right. And so there, to the extent that the loads in the trucks are, have more than six inches of freeboard, the city would be requiring a cover where a state law says that a cover is not allowed, is not required. And that's, that's. That's not being stricter? That's an inconsistency, not. The, the stricter requirement doesn't apply when you're talking about something that is either required or not required. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? So I declare the uh, public hearing uh, open on new regulations for heavy manufacturing businesses and amending and updating Title V business license and regulations. The clerk, please call the first person. Bill Barnett. Noah Barnett with Simex, 420 Southwest 11th Avenue in Canby. Um, as outlined in the letter we submitted to all the members of the council uh, on Friday, um, we, we do have some serious concerns about the ordinance that are being proposed. 
Um, it's understanding that the council intends to vote on whether or not to uh, implement the ordinances two weeks from today. Um, we do not feel that it's an adequate time for us to review, assess, and provide feedback um, to the proposed ordinances. Um, thus, we're requesting that the proposed ordinances uh, be taken off the agenda. And Simex would like to engage in communication and work together with the city uh, moving forward to accomplish uh, its reg regulatory objectives. Um, we're one of the oldest businesses here in Kenmore, and uh, we want to continue to be part of the community. Thank you. Janet Hayes. Can you please Jim. come up and state your name and address for the record? Janet Hayes, 6303 Northeast 181st um, in Kenmore. Um, what's happened so far since the hours have been no noise before 7 till I don't know what time at night on weekdays, it's been Monday through Friday and none on Saturday, even though they t every day go beyond that. We don't call in on the little construction job doing across the street from us because they wake us up at 6 o'clock on Saturday morning pounding nails. Nobody in our building is called. Nobody's at City Hall to take the call. Nobody listens. The same thing They'll start earlier than the time you put down. You can put down 7 o'clock. I'm telling you, they all start at 5 and 4 right now. So why put down 6? Just open them all night. But give us something back. That's the problem. Cement is out there banging trucks. Mrs. Hayes, would you please address the council? Cement, the cement company is out banging and cleaning the inside of their trucks during the winter to get the ice off the insides way before they start at 7. They are not going to pay attention and your community is going to get apathetic like they are right now. And they are apathetic. I don't want to call when I smell asphalt. It does no good. You get put into a circular bin. That's all you do. Or you go around a rabbit hole. I don't complain about anything because it's useless. And that's how I feel about the responses unless there's some big changes made. If you want Kenmore to be spectacular, be a little bit different. Think outside of the box that you're riding along in. We need to. It could be great. And some people have that vision and still believe in it, but I just, I just don't see anybody following it. Like this ordinance, it's ridiculous. Let them start at six, that means five. You don't live here. You don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hayes. E Elizabeth Mooney. Elizabeth Mooney, 5934 Northeast 201st Street, Kenmore. Um, I just want to draw together a few of the ideas that just came up here. Noel Barnett's, Kate Donaldson's, Janet's. There could be a forum. I know that's what Kate was talking about. Kate breathes in and tastes the fumes on her sheets. You know, good grief. But whose fault is it? It's not hers. It's not Smex's. It's really your responsibility because you set the policy. So given the situation that got out of control, I don't think we predicted that we were going to be tasting asphalt fumes. It started in, what, 2013 when our shoreline master plan didn't go to Superior Court, I think. That was the day the Pope was announced, and I put on my Facebook that white smoke was coming out of the asphalt 
plant. Now maybe it's just a coincidence, but I think Cemex is smart. And I thought they said, hey, those three ladies, Ann Hurst, Janet Hayes, and Elizabeth Mooney, they're not going to spend another, whatever, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars of their own money instead of sending it to their family. They're going to give up. And Cemex was right there that day. It was disgusting. I took a picture, put it on my Facebook. They're no dummies, but you know what? I think that that company is not the problem. Because if you get rid of them with your ordinance, they've been here apparently for years and years. I didn't know because I never noticed them being so obnoxious until 2013. I didn't. Maybe I wasn't paying attention, but I never noticed disgusting asphalt fumes that I can taste when I run down from my house, go to the 192. Today it wasn't on, but it's overwhelming. And who in their right mind is going to buy the as the the new apartments? What's going to happen to the homeless mother's children who are going to suck in the fumes? That's just wrong. They're not monitored. They don't have to monitor them. So the only solution is that you get together. They're offering to get together. They don't want you to do the ordinance without some more talk. But don't leave out the community, please. Do not go to staff and have your meetings with Cemex without including, please, us. Especially the people like Patrick O'Brien, who's breathing it, Janet Hayes, who's breathing it, and Kate Donaldson, who's breathing it. And I would love it if you would include PERC, because People for Environmentally Responsible Kenmore is a good nonprofit, and I'm president of it, and I would like to be there. And we have met with these good folks. And another thing that was pointed out by our good new manager, well, I don't want to give him, I don't, sorry, but this is just one point that may not, you can deny that you said this, but sorry, okay, I'll tell you what I'm thinking. Way back when I was talking about, you know, can't we get rid of CMAX, they're disgusting, it's before I met them and went to their facility and met Noel, who is a good advocate for them, and Aaron, who is also a good person. The point was, okay, if you oust them, I know I'm, all, I'm a little bit over, but I, this is just the beginning. I'm sorry, just give me a, one more minute, please, Mayor. If you oust them, the facility is still there because it's just leased from Cal Portland. So who are you going to get in there to replace Cemex? I've looked on their website. They would actually probably, I'm speaking for you, but I'm hoping that Cemex, has, who has a good reputation for environmental stewardship, they would be able to do something that is of higher standards if we required it in our city. And we said, we need you to monitor at least the fumes that are coming out of your facility. I would think that would be a compromise. If they will monitor it, then I know whether we're being poisoned. But I'm sure that there's a whole domino effect. And I don't know that without us all getting together. But that's what I would recommend, is you have a meeting, within the next two weeks to give us a date, and sometime this summer, while the bikers are still on the Burt Gilman Trail, and you guys wake up and you cause some kind of policy change so that our bikers don't quit going on the Burt Gilman Trail. You know there was a cancer run a year and a half ago, or two years ago? They ran to Lake Forest Park because of the fumes. But again, it's not CMEX. It's that they need to be expected to do the right thing, which is monitor their fumes. So we have a forum, we have a community discussion with Kate, Mrs. it's very Moody, good. if I could get you to please wrap up. Okay, could you at least give us a date so we can put it in our calendar so we have some hope from our council? Patrick O'Brien. Patrick O'Brien, 633, what is my address? 6330 Northeast 181st Street. Um, first of all, uh, let me talk to staff's position that this is a nuisance. This is not a nuisance, this is a health risk. It cannot be minimized, made small by saying, Oh, it's just a nuisance. We should cubbyhole it over here. And when staff gets there in the morning, then we'll address it. No, 
all the 911 calls, all the emails that I've generated, I've sent to Rob Carlinzi so he could delegate that to the appropriate people. I want to know from staff how many citations he offered, what the total value of those citations were, and if he bothered to check with the 911 calls that came in to, and went to our police chief, where the police chief was instructed not, not, to go and see what the noise or the, uh, the uh, smoke uh, was all about. So I think that totally blows out of the water, oh, we had nine complaints. Baloney. Nine complaints, try, try nine complaints a week, maybe from one person. <laughs> it's, it's tri he's trivializing it. Secondly, from what I sent Rob, I sent him the state law and our own very own Kenmore code on hours of operation and noise levels and decibels. And in the hours of operation are not what staff has reflected at all. And I sent that to Rob. Look at that. I had a shoreline sergeant say, on Saturday morning, you can't operate till 10 a.m. I had a st the sergeant, and I have his number. I have his name. It's not 9 or 6 in the morning, and you have to work with, with the people who live there. And you want to create a core across the street, how many yards from the prevailing wind of this place? No more than 300 yards to the stacks to your city center. A nuisance? Come on. That's ridiculous. Why don't they move the plant to Sand Point? They got $40 million over the next closest bid. Maybe it was 30. And I can tell you, Sand Point's a lot closer to the 520 bridge or even the deep bore tunnel support work or all the work that's going to go on in Seattle than Kenmore. And then that would give us a time to mitigate the whole Kenmore industrial property, which was court ordered to happen. It was, not, it was not told, oh, no, it's fine to just cover it with a couple feet of overlay and then let an unlined uh, hazardous waste dump continue leaching into Lake Washington. I mean, the new Governor Inslee yesterday announced new clean water laws in the state. It's imperative to this state to have clean water. We might be exporting water someday to California when they totally go bone dry. But you, you can't have a hazardous waste dump sitting in the most pristine lake uh, of any lake that's got such a, an amount of, of downtown Seattle, Bellevue, Renton, that, that's a huge infrastructure, it's a huge city complex, and to, uh, to continue to not clean that up is crazy. They cleaned up the lower Duwamish. Why wouldn't we clean up Lake Washington? Uh, so look at the code that we have on the books already. There's ample Kenmore code, and if forced, and if fined, then you'll be putting money into the coffers for what they do. I don't think you need to have anything other than enforcing what you've got on the city books and the state books, and it's, and it's not as reported the hours of operation. Read the state ordinances, read your own city ordinances, and you'll know that that is a fantasy on what the proper operation of a heavy industrial site is adjoining a city and adjoining residential communities. Pete Stoltz. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Pete Stoltz. I am here from Cal Portland. I'm the uh, manager of permitting and government affairs. I would like just for the record to say that I've been at the company since 2002. I've been contacted once to have a meeting with citizens of Kenmore. And we had it pretty much immediately here a few weeks ago. And we just had a second meeting with them. And um, to my knowledge, no one's ever pushed anybody that I'm aware of, and I would like to talk to Mr. O'Brien and get the specifics of that event and make sure I can get to the bottom of it, just for the record. Going on to this topic of these um, ordinances, um, I'd like to make it clear that Cal Portland met, brings aggregate into the, into the facility down here. We manufacture concrete. We don't make asphalt. Um, we 
We operate under the state NORS ordinance in every other jurisdiction that we're involved in. And we'll be happy to work with the city and um, develop a monitoring program and figure out how to comply and, um, and work within that ordinance. Um, we don't think we should be singled out and lumped in with pawn shops and massage parlors and pot dispensaries. We don't think that the regulatory uh, permit is appropriate. Um, if you do decide to adopt a regulatory uh, license, we have some additional concerns. Um, one is that the regulatory license as proposed would require uh, noise monitoring to be conducted under the license. Um, I'm not necessarily opposed to the requirement of noise monitoring, but the way that it's envisioned in the license and the way that's proposed would be very problematic. It, it simply requires you to put um, noise monitoring equipment up on the hill, which would be on the other side of the highway, and it would be very hard to figure out, well, who generated the noise, what exactly was the nature of it, that sort of thing. We can develop a better noise monitoring program that can be more effective and help the city meet the objectives. I'm, I'm concerned that if this process goes in as it is, um, there's going to be a significant burden on us, but also a significant burden on city administrative staff to review it and, and comply with it and enforce it. Um, <clears throat> the proposed nuisance ordinance is also um, unreasonable. Um, not like the state code. The noise ordinance says, um, it prohibits any sound from the property, which is just simply a standard that we can't meet. A flag snapping in the wind could potentially be that, you know, be a violation of that. Other provisions in your nuisance ordinance say, you know, a certain number of decibels at a certain distance away, for example, a PA system at a car lot or something like that. Um, we can work and find a reasonable, um, you know, approach to that problem. But, um, I would really encourage the city to, to um, consider just going with the noise ordinance or the noise, adopting the state noise code. And let us work with the city on complying with that and see whether that gets you to the objectives that you want to reach. And if not, then there may be an opportunity for future legislative action with some of these other measures. But um, the state noise code has. You know, it's established, it's used in a lot of jurisdictions, it's been demonstrated to be um, effective and protective of the public interest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Stoltz. Kate Donaldson. Kate Donaldson, um, 6401 Northeast 181st in Kenmore. And I had no idea I'd be speaking right now. Um, I guess it's just interesting to me that anybody would have any issue with a noise ordinance. I just, I don't understand um, where these people are coming from. Um, what I'm wondering is how does it behoove the people of Kenmore to have these businesses. I mean, I, I'm really naive about this, and I'm I, honestly, I have no idea. So um, I don't understand why would do we get some sort of um, is there some monetary um, value to this for for the people who are putting up with it, or the people of Kenmore, or um, is it, do we just have nothing to do with it? It's all business and they can do whatever they want to. The people who own Cal Portland, um, why should we put up with it? I, I just don't understand how it's, um, it's bettering the community or just even monetarily. And maybe I'm sure there's a very good answer for that. I just don't know it. So I'd like to have that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Donaldson. There's no one else signed up. Anybody else wishing to be heard? Is anybody else wishing to be heard on the uh, new regulations for heavy manufacturing businesses and amending and updating Title V of the business license regulation? 
Anybody else wishing to be heard on uh, the new regulations for heavy manufacturing businesses and amending and updating Title V business licenses and regulations? Seeing nobody coming forward, I declare the public hearing uh, closed. The next item on the agenda is public hearing and discussion of ordinance number 15-0398, temporarily eliminating road impact fee and minimum parking requirements for changes of use of existing buildings in the north sub area of the regional business zone east of 68th Street. Mr. Hampson. Thank you. So currently, Anytime there's a uh, change of use to an existing building, we take a look at um, road impact fees and minimum parking requirements, among other things, but mainly those two things. Um, and usually, if it's a change of use to a more uh, dense use, it will trigger a road impact fee or additional parking regulations. And so our road impact fees are sort of high and detour uh, new business from establishing in Kenmore. Did some research and I, I think there's only been one business since we incorporated that has paid a road impact fee based on a change of use to a new um, establishment. Um, and that took a lot of effort on staff to you know make that work so it's very difficult to work with um, existing businesses or excuse me new businesses that are coming into town to be in existing business buildings because of the high fees for one and second is the parking requirements um, most of these buildings are already constructed the the boundaries are already established their their property boundaries are established and mostly their um, parking lots are already built. And so when we have new businesses come to town and they want to establish an existing business, we basically already have our, our uh, parameters set on the property. And so realistically, a new business that comes at an existing business, if it's a startup business or it's a, a small operation, they don't have the capital to um, build, construct a parking facility, because more than not, it'd be a parking garage of some sort, underground, above ground. Um, so that also deters um, potential new businesses coming to Kenmore. And so we're seeing a trend along the, the um, north sub area of the regional business zone. So the north sub area is basically that area between State Route 522 and Northeast 175th Street. And uh, it goes two properties west of 68th um, Avenue. So there's a total of 19 properties there, but we're seeing a trend of new businesses trying to come and get established in that area. And so, um, you know, we're taking a look at a pilot program to um, be able to eliminate the minimum parking standard requirements for that that area, and also the road impact fees during that pilot project, which would be which would be a 18-month uh, um, project. And during that time, we could be uh, taking a look at how well it works. And um, if there's a need to do something differently in our code regulations elsewhere about the parking requirements, not necessarily the impact fees. The, uh, as I mentioned, the, the pilot program would be 18 months. It would only be for change of uses in existing buildings. And it wouldn't include dwelling units or additions to the buildings. If there was an addition to a building, they'd be required to pay the road impact fees, you know, proportionate to the addition of the building. Um, it would eliminate the road impact fees across the board during this pilot program. Um, it would eliminate the minimum parking space requirements across the board during this pilot program, with the caveat that the uh, business, if the business takes advantage of the Elimination of the minimum parking space requirements, they would have to pay the city $7,500 a year, up to five years, for the city to use for parking related purposes. And if any time during that five year period the business um, entered into an agreement with a, a, another a business for uh, a shared use uh, parking lot, 
then they would they could stop paying that amount. So that's the essence of the uh, pilot program, and it's um, just going to be our proposal is the north sub area of the regional business zone east of 68th, so it doesn't include those two parcels that are part of the, the business area um, west of 68th. With that, I'm open for questions. Questions. Councilmember Curtis. So you mentioned that change of use uh, rarely pays the impact fees. Do new buildings generally comply with parking and the road impact fees? Is there a distinction between change of use versus brand new building? Yes, let me see if I understand the question. Do Are you asking do new buildings pay a uh, road impact fee and provide minimum parking spaces? Yes, they do. And during this pilot program, any new buildings in this area would still be required to meet those code regulations. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Hearing none, I uh, declare the public hearing on uh, ordinance number 15-0398, temporary elimination of uh, road impact fee and minimum parking requirements for changes of use of existing buildings in the north sub area of the regional business on RBZ east of 68th Street to be open. Will the clerk please call the first person? Patrick O'Brien. Patrick O'Brien, 6330 Northeast 181st Street, Kenmore. It seems as though that staff is not identifying the beneficiaries of this waiver of fees. Uh, I'd like to know which businesses will be impacted by name, and I would also like to know if there's going to be an increase in density of either uh, uh, what sort of commercial activity is going to increase as a result of the redevelopment of this area? It seems to me that it, it's part and parcel with possibly something uh, along the plywood supply area. Uh, plywood supply has taken advantage of the city several times, to my recollection, in putting uh, uh, unlicensed asphalt down to the slough next to where the rowing center is. There was no permit pulled for that. Uh, I'd made inquiries. I took pictures of that asphalt lane and being next to the slough. That would be very important to document and to get uh, a notification of. Um, this waiving of $7,500, uh, well, let's, let's just look at Kenmore in the future. Uh, we're talking about the huge transit impact Kenmore is going to have and how we're the middle of the teeter-totter between Seattle and Bellevue. Well, where's all the parking going to come from? The, all the parking is going to come from exactly that corridor and across the street at the Metro Park and Ride. That whole area is due. You could probably make a lot of money if the city just did a multi-story parking garage for all the people that wanted to drive down from Snohomish County, catch some sort of light rail or sound transit to Bellevue or Seattle, and, and we would basically be the nesting area for all the transportation that put people on other forms of, of uh, metro or sound transit. So, so why would you eliminate the need for parking? Why would you give it a pass on fees? You wouldn't. You wouldn't. This is a tailor-made effort to save people who have already been in discussions with development with with you with with uh, staff perhaps but they want to have a pass on this and you should not allow a pass on this you should maximize the amount of parking in the area where the 192 is that uh, all those businesses along there are right in line with people getting on and off buses and there should be more parking not less in those areas um, so Let's name the beneficiaries. Let's find out what the real plan is on what those businesses have in mind for uh, density, uh, uh, more tri trips. Uh, they're, they're redeveloping for a reason. That usually means more people in an area, not less. 
So why don't we fully investigate the names of the beneficiaries, what projects they have in mind, and bring that to the public's attention because the public might want to know and be part of the process rather than some obscure, oh yes, we're east of 68th and we're, I mean, let me get my GPS out while I try to figure out exactly where that is. That is not being upfront and honest about what the, prog what the program is and you need to be for the people to understand why they're giving it up these impact fees, period. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. There's no one else signed up. Nobody else was to be heard. Any further questions for the council? I anybody else wishing to be heard on uh, on the uh, temporary eliminating a road impact fee and minimum parking requirements for changes of <coughs> use in a, of existing buildings in the north sub area of the regional business zone east of 16th Avenue? Anybody else wishing to be heard? Anybody else wishing to be heard on? Uh, the, the temporary elimination of road impact fees and minimum parking requirements for changes of use of existing buildings in the north sub area of the regional business zone east of 68th Avenue. <coughs> I declare the public hearing now closed. Next item on the agenda, Mr. Hampson, you're really on it. Mayor, tonight. can I uh, suggest a five minute break for us to get set up? You certainly okay. can. Five minutes. All right.
million bucks. You've got over twelve million dollars in this. Kenmore City Council is uh, back in session. Uh, Mr. Hampson, we were uh, talking about this is, this is like all you tonight. You, you've been very busy. And so uh, next item on the agenda is the uh, Kenmore Village uh, Spencer Square Development Agreement discussion. Mr. Hampson. Thank you, Your Honor, and members of the City Council. My name is Rob Carlinzi, City Manager. and. Um, the Kenmore Village project has been a 
project that's been going on for quite some time. The city purchased the Kenmore Village properties about 10 years ago. In 2012, we went through a community involvement process on how best to take the uh, properties to market. And from that community involvement process, we established a positioning statement for the property, um, obtained great feedback from the citizens and the community on uh, what we want for our downtown and goals for our downtown. And a result, as a result, and a result of that positioning statement, we took the properties to market and listed them. The uh, city received about 16 proposals for the um, properties, um, about eight proposals for the upper or the upper lot, which is the former King County Park and Ride, and about eight proposals for the commercial piece. The city moved uh, forward more quickly on the upper lot and entered into um, a purchase and sale agreement and ultimately a development agreement and approved site plan for the Spencer 68 development project. And uh, that property uh, closed in 2014, and soon, th soon thereafter, Main Street Property Group, the buyer of the property and the developer, uh, broke ground, and they've been under construction for 138 residential units, and a couple of the buildings are done now. Um, Two. Yep, and uh, the others should be done very soon in the next month or two, and that project is um, doing what we hoped it would and it being built according to the plans that you all adopted and we're very pleased with that. We also entered into negotiations with Main Street Property Group for the purchase of the commercial piece. They were one of just a few uh, developers that actually um, made offers on both the upper and the commercial properties and so because uh, of that and because of um, our experience with them, we decided to um, work with them on them purchasing this property. And on November 3rd, 2014, you, the City Council, approved a purchase and sale agreement for Kenmore, for Main Street Property Group to purchase the Kenmore Village parcel. That purchase and sale agreement contemplated a development agreement and it um, mentioned certain points that could be deal points that would be negotiated in a development agreement. So for the past few months, we've been in negotiations with Main Street Property Group for a development agreement. They actually closed on the property in March, so they have owned the commercial portion of the property since March, and we've been moving forward with them on the development agreement. The city is keeping, um, if we can point at that, the city is retaining and continuing to own the uh, southeast corner of the Kenmore Village property, which we're calling our town green. So it'll be right there on that, uh, that corner on uh, 181st and 68th and also fronting 181st Street. We anticipate breaking ground on our town green in mid-October and being completed and, and being uh, finished with that project, including the um, community building um, in the summertime. In addition, Main Street Property Group has an option to purchase what we call the um, sit-down restaurant pad, and so which is just to the west of the town green, and Brian is showing that pad with the cursor right now. That also fronts 181st. Main Street Property Group has the option to um, purchase this property when they produce a lease with a sit-down restaurant. And that restaurant would abut the west end of the town green. So what I'd like to do now is uh, turn it over briefly to Brian Hampson to go over some, um, some of the main deal points and talk to you about the proposed development agreement. We are not asking you to approve it tonight. In fact, a draft of the agreement is not in your packets tonight. So the council bill just summarizes some of the main deal points. Right now we're in the process of putting the finishing touches on the development agreement. We will have that ready well in advance of the meeting of the July 
27th City Council meeting. And at that meeting, we will be asking you to consider and hopefully approve a development agreement uh, that night again on July 27th. So tonight is for discussion and introduction purposes only. We'll have Main Street Property Group uh, go through uh, their plan and vision for the property and what they hope to accomplish there. But uh, with that, I'll just turn it over to Brian and he can go over a summary of the main deal points. Thanks, Rob. And thanks, Council. There's been a, a slight modification to our proposed plans. Uh, recently, we've learned that the, one of the modifications that they're going to be asking for is going to be asking for a second, or is going to be requiring a second public hearing. And so um, we're going to be bringing this back to you next Monday for the first public hearing, and then on the 27th for the second public hearing. Uh, we didn't make the uh, um, public notification period in time for this one to be considered a public hearing. But um, with that, um, Main Street's asking for some deviations from the uh, city's development regulations, such as uh, building design standards, building height. Building height is one of those um, um, things that require two public hearings. Parking minimums, building setbacks and landscaping. And the purpose of these deviations is to maximize or enhance both the investment as well as the intensity of the uses in the core of the city's downtown. Some of the uh, deviations are also requested due to the uh, topo topographic um, um, nature of the property. Um, Main Street is also asking to get a 10-year vesting into their permits or their entitlements. Uh, easements to install water and utility lines under the town green. Impact fee vesting, meaning Main Street will pay the current impact fees for the duration of the development agreement. Uh, the development agreement term itself is 10 years. Uh, in return, we've been negotiating with Main Street, and some of these are um, still being discussed, but to pay the impact fees at the building permit issuance instead of at the occupancy. Uh, Main Street has agreed to sponsor some town green events in the, um, in the town green and pavilion area. Um, that we're looking at per, uh, constructing 68th uh, parking along 68th Avenue Northeast on both sides of the street. And so we haven't yet um, hammered out or ironed out all those uh, details, but that will be coming forward. With, with that uh, parking al along uh, 68th Avenue, there's some restriping that will need to be done. Um, They'll be working on the improvements for the Northeast 181st Street and 67th uh, entrance to the site. Upon completion, or the construction and completion of the sit-down restaurant, um, it kind of makes sense for Main Street to take a look at that uh, town green area and also Im improve that area as necessary, depending on what their plans are for that restaurant. So there's a portion of the town green area that's not included in our current um, design is being finished at this time. And so we're going to leave that until we figure out what the, the restaurant use is and, and kind of make it work together. The uh, demolition of the remaining buildings on parcel B and D um, will happen before October 1st um, if the uh, development agreement gets approved. Uh, currently, the purchase and sale agreement only talks about the, um, the buildings on Parcel D, which is that old fitness building um, being de No, I got that wrong. That's the actual the, uh, Parcel D, which is the, um, the, the uh, commercial building uh, that would be demoed in a particular time frame. So this, they'll be doing all of them at one time and hopefully before October 1st. Um, they're going to be taking a look at grading the entire site for the uh, Main Street, um, Spencer Square, and the uh, city's town green portion. They've got extra dirt. We need dirt. And so um, they'll be bringing over dirt and uh, putting it on our property. That's really <coughs> the negotiating deal points that we're talking about now with the development agreement. The rest of the, uh, the items in their proposal, they meet our downtown design standards or our code requirements. But I did want to point out one thing. I think there was some con confusion with the requirement or the um, proposal for the parking along 68th Street. It's important to point out that um, Main Street uh, doesn't need that parking on 68th Street. They have enough parking within their site for their uses. And so that um, additional parking on 68th would be beneficial to the rest of the, the city. 
I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kelly Price from Main Street. Sure. Thanks, Brian. Uh, and I'll be quick here just with an uh, introduction um, and a little bit of an update on Spencer 6 because I know everyone's been interested in the progress that we've been making there, and it um, seems like things are changing every day. Um, so thanks. Uh, I'm Kelly Price. I'm the president of Main Street Property Group. Uh, it's great to be back speaking uh, to you tonight about um, our upcoming project. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Kim Faust uh, with Main Street. Um, you all have met her in the past. She's the project manager in charge of Spencer 6A and uh, the Kenmore Village project. And then from the Dolan Group, we have Tony Radovich and Sean Whitaker. Uh, both are senior uh, designers and planners with the Dolan Group. Um, Dolan uh, was the architect behind Spencer 68 and a number of other projects that we've done and we have a um, multi-decade relationship with the Dolan Group and we're just uh, continuing that and it's been a great uh, a great ongoing uh, process with them. So before we get to the main point of uh, our presentation and I turn it over to uh, uh, Tony and Sean, just a quick update on Spencer 68. We are opening our third building, uh, actually on Wednesday of this week, if you can believe that. Uh, this building is the one uh, immediately adjacent to 68th. We actually have four residents slated to move in on Wednesday, and then a steady stream uh, thereafter. We've opened two buildings so far. Uh, both are virtually 100% leased. Um, from a demographic standpoint, well, overall, we have about 50% of the 138 units uh, committed to residents of Kenmore and new residents to Kenmore. Um, interestingly enough, uh, our largest units have been uh, in very high demand. Um, if you recall, we have a number of two-story uh, townhome units, um, and there was a waiting list for those, and there's a waiting list today. A uh, number of the residents are younger families with kids, um, a number of folks downsizing who live in Kenmore today and are downsizing to uh, an apartment. So it's been a great mix of folks. About half of the residents are from the city of Kenmore. Um, and then our next largest uh, city is the city of Seattle. And then Bothell, Bellevue, Kirkland, Redmond. Um, a number of folks relocating from other parts of the country as well. Uh, virtually sight unseen. They've seen the videos, they've seen the renderings, they've talked to our people, they've had uh, video tours of uh, the apartment they'd live in, and our first resident arrives from Arizona um, to move into the uh, latest building on Wednesday. So it's exciting times next door, uh, still a lot to do. Uh, we have the fourth building, which is the largest building, uh, opens up in September, uh, if all goes well, and uh, there's still a tremendous amount of, of work to be done there. And that uh, fourth building has the main common amenity area to the project, which includes a pickleball court, um, outdoor barbecue, a large outdoor deck, uh, views of Lake Washington. It's going to be a, a spectacular space. And look forward to hosting you all there once we get it open and, and, um, and run through a few test runs of how everything works. Um, so things have gone so well at Spencer 68. We actually are uh, working on the permitting for phase two. Um, we're leading off with two uh, two buildings in phase two. One 11 unit, uh, mostly townhome uh, building, and the other is very similar to the building that's being built along the south southern edge, the larger building. So we're permitting those, and we uh, are going to be breaking ground with site work here later in July or early August. So great news with Spencer 68. Um, residents have been extremely happy, and, and uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun to to be a part of. Uh, so we're excited about this next project. What we're really going to present to you tonight is the concept and the plans behind uh, the building on the north lot. I don't know what letter that is, but it's the lot that is immediately adjacent to Kenmore Camera. Um, the southern lot and the restaurant pad are um, really just part of the site plan application today. We don't have uh, designs prepared to present for those, and, and they're in the very early on schematic. So we're going to really focus on the northern, um, northern building. 
Uh, that project is, is about 90 apartment units and roughly 20,000 square feet of commercial um, office space. And uh, you're, you're probably aware, but we've reached an agreement in principle with Evergreen Healthcare to be the uh, tenant in all 20,000 square feet in that space. So we worked for a long time uh, with Evergreen and others who were interested. And like I've said from day one, really our heart uh, was telling us that uh, Evergreen would be the, uh, the best user for that space. And sure enough, they um, recommitted and, and doubled their commitment to the city of Kenmore um, by agreeing to, uh, to be the tenant there. So that's, that's great, and we're happy that that um, worked out. What's key for them is going to be that we hit our construction and planning dates, and that's why we're here tonight. Um, so with that, I'd turn it over to Tony and Sean to kind of run through the building. Thank you. Um, my name's Tony Radovich. Is this working? Turn it on. There you go. Button, button, button. button needs to be up. Up. Okay. My name is Tony Radovich. I'm with the Dolan Group, and um, I'm a senior architect, senior associate. This is senior designer, Sean Whitaker. Um, we're very pleased and honored to have the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Um, we, uh, we're really excited about what this building is about. Um, we've done a number of projects like this in the past, and it, it's very exciting to see a town kind of come on a new path and become revitalized. We've, we've seen this over and over again in a number of towns. And we're kind of excited about the vision that you have put forth. And we see our role, and we're very pleased that Main Street Properties invited us to help in this process to, you know, see the vision that you have put forth and what you want to see in your town. Um, we've been working uh, in, with um, Main Street and prior to that many other builders in the Northwest for over 20 years. Um, and we have a long history of, of work in this area in both single family, multifamily, and of course, larger buildings such as this. Um, we, w well, we, we recognize that this site is a really, you know, a, it's a special site. It's directly across the street. And we felt that it, it, it deserved a, a, a level of design and architecture that was commiserate with its location. Uh, we feel that um, we wanted to do something that was uh, uh, pedestrian friendly, that was very, um, uh, it, had, it had a scale at the lower levels. And I, can we turn to the uh, slide that has the, um, the, uh, the uh, actually, why don't we switch to the slide that I would like to go to. I'm speeding through because you see this one on the board here. Uh, I, I'd like to start small and, and because that's where it all starts and, and it's all about people and, and the people that, that, that experience this and, and activating the street and, and, and making it an inviting and uh, addition to the town. Uh, we tried to do architecture that opens up to the community, that the wall that you're seeing there has the opportunity to open up as, as a, a possible opening wall. And we wanted it to really make it a, um, a great addition to the town. We wanted to keep the architecture um, friendly to uh, the community, but we also wanted it to be somewhat iconic. As you can see, we've done a lot of um, different types of projects in the area. Um, working with Main Street and we're very proud of the work that we've done with them and we're really looking forward to kind of taking it to the next level with this location. We felt that this location was deserving of something that was a little more iconic and special given the nature of the mixed use, the fantastic tenant that has committed to the space and um, and, and, and it's a very special location and hopefully a catalyst for the revitalization and or the continued revitalization of a, of a downtown area. Um, and, you know, we see this as just the first piece of a larger <laughs> puzzle. Um, but I think that we're very excited that this can add a, a, hopefully a lot to your community. 
With that, I'd like to turn it over to Sean, who is going to talk more specifically about the architecture. Hi, Sean Whitaker. Um, so I, I, I'm excited to be here. Um, what I want to say first is that I, I really appreciate um, both the vision that the city has for its future, uh, as well as the, the political ability to um, m realize the future. Um, some towns don't have that. <clears throat> and I want to speak a little bit about urban planning before I speak about architecture. Um, what I've learned is that residential and, and high density residential development is really the key to vital uh, urban centers. Uh, and, and I think that the key to that is because people don't leave at night. People are still there at night. Um, and they're, they're looking for restaurants. They're looking for shopping. They're walking their pets. They're exercising. And they're, they're meeting each other. And that's, that's what vitalizes the streets. And that's what um, makes the community safe at night and, um, and, and keeps people there. We, we talk all the time about creating walkable streets, but you know, we need people. That, that's the first step, is, is having the people on the street and giving them places to walk to. And so um, some of the specific items as we move into the architecture uh, that, are, that are critical to walkable streets happen at the, at the pedestrian scale. And so I, I think they're evident in our imagery, but I would point out the materials at the pedestrian level. And um, they're appropriate materials to the area, and they're also beautiful materials. <clears throat> um, cover is critical at the pedestrian level. We, we've worked with staff you know, to, to create each, each element that sort of activates the streets once you have the people. Uh, cover is one item. Recessed entries. Um, we'll have a, a special entry alcove at the lobby with, with um, special pavers that delineate the entry. Um, both street trees and lighting are key. And they're also key to the continuity of the street. I think Kim will point out how parking helps to pedestrianize the streets. That may be surprising, but it, it dampens traffic. And there's also a certain amount of activity that's key to these walkable streets. I'll show a couple images. Just the images that you see at the bottom of this slide are, are kind of nice streets, pedestrian friendly streets. They're, they're places where you want to walk. I also, I also mentioned a main street. My, my staff was excited when I showed them the images of your city hall. They like your building and, and we're, we're excited to be next door. Tony pointed out a number of the buildings that we've done before, and these were, I would say these are key pieces of um, urban revitalization in, in your neighboring cities. The, the order of the building, I want it to be elegant and sort of appropriately respectful, powerful, um, also iconic. It's, it's a key corner. If I point out the corner element, this will be a key corner to your downtown, and this image is, is important. We want it to be strong. Um, that's sort of the area where we allowed ourselves to play a little bit as designers. Um, beyond that, what you have is a, is a classic order, actually. You have a toe, a body, and a head to a building, which is sort of what I, what I learned when I was beginning in architecture about what what buildings are, certainly bigger buildings. So you have sort of the pedestrian level, then you have most of the building, and then the building has a top. And at the top, we step back and we change materials. <clears throat> I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have uh, about the building, uh, but I'd just like to say again, uh, we're excited to be here, we're excited to be part of the future, and we appreciate the opportunity. Please. 
Well, we were excited to have you here, too, and we've waited a long time to see pictures like this, so we appreciate that. I think what would help me is to, if you could um, relate this to the street and, you know, like what streets are we looking at and kind of give us an idea of the height, the relative height. I know this is a sloping site and it, it's not all that sure. obvious. Sure. So this, this prominent corner that I'm talking about is along 68th Street. And it's, it's the southern, it's the southeastern part of this building. I can point it out in the, mm -hmm. in the plan. So it's, it's this corner of the building. Okay. The entire building that we're showing today is this L-shaped piece, labeled as Spencer Square Mixed Use. Mixed use means, typically what it means is a vertical mixed use, where you have commercial at the pedestrian level and you have residences above. Um, our building's along 68th Street here, and most of the shots that you're seeing, most of the perspectives are along 68th. I can go back to those and point out where each one occurs. So this is the northern corner of the building as you move along 68th, and then as you move down the hill, this is the southern corner of our proposed building. This would be the southwestern corner. And then the last one is of the entry, which is along 68th, kind of approximately at the center of the building, along 68th. That, that would serve as both the entry to the, the commercial and residential. You, you would enter into a common lobby and then turn left into this residential lobby, which is what you're seeing on this corner. I think it might be helpful if you showed the one that shows Spencer 68 and explain that that's Spencer along 68. Sure. I don't know if that's as clear. So building C of Spencer 68 is being completed right now. That's along 68. Go to the rendering that shows that though. Okay. There. That's so, yeah. this, this building's being built. This is the building that's right across the street. Yeah, we'll see this outside right now. And so our, our building will be immediately south of that. There will be, there's, there's a proposed driveway to parking there and, and that driveway continues to Kenmore Camera and to our parking area. Yeah, a couple of quick things to, exactly. Yes. A couple of things to point out. The building itself is built above a parking garage. So on basically on grade, um, one of the ways that we deal with the grade is by lifting the building up putting the majority of the cars underneath the building. Then you have the commercial space on top of that parking garage on a podium. And then you've got the residential uh, above that. The, the commercial space also, if you notice the building's basically in an L shape um, with the bottom of the L being a long 68. So there's an entrance to a, a parking area on top of the podium that would be uh, the commercial parking area during the day and during their hours of operation. So there's a dedicated area for commercial parking. They also park in the, in the garage uh, with the residents. So there's a mixed, uh, there's a shared element of the parking um, as well. So this is the dedicated commercial parking, which is the upper level of our parking. You can also continue on the alley down, and then into the lower garage area. How much higher is this um, building than the highest Spencer 68s? Is it a full story higher? Um, no, it's not a full story. It, Without having the numbers in front of me, it's, it's six or seven feet taller. Okay, thanks. It's a few feet taller. So one of the proposals was to uh, restripe 68th there. Um, do we have any renderings of what, or any proposals of what that would look like? Do you want to show the, to the end of the slide? Because what I saw in the agenda pack, it wasn't very clear. Well, we, we've had a couple proposals um, that our traffic engineer has done that show a couple options that we're working with the city staff on. And essentially what it does, it, it depends on what kind of turn lanes the city ultimately wants and bike lanes. 
but there's um, a number of different options that vary between you know 18 and 29 stalls along various portions of 68th on both sides of the street. To answer your question, there's not a specific proposal because we're still working with staff to okay. get what both sides want. Yeah, it's, just, it's an interesting street here because it's um, engineered like a lot of our 35s, but it's a 25. And so I think if we, if, while we're doing this, we look at ways to slow people down even further to the actual speed limit. That would be wonderful. Okay. I'm, also, um, I'm also concerned about, uh, you know, if we're redoing that, I, I would very much like to see some bike facilities in there as much as possible because it's kind of the main way if you're coming from this part of the city mm -hmm. to get to the Burt Gilman, you have to come through here. And um, I, I would be much more in favor if we had that rather than not. Myself. Yes, that's we we talked about only time limit parking along there. No, that'd be our decision anyway. So, Mr. Price, <coughs> there, there there seems to be one element missing: the town clock. It would really be nice. <laughs> 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 Oh, uh, well, what I suggested to Rob today was that, that the town clock would be good in the town green. <laughs> he, he said the architect cringed when... <laughs> you might put one there then for us? Well, I think what, what Rob and I talked about is the, on the southern property and on the restaurant property and the western edge of the town green, you know, those are still largely blank canvases. And... You know, it's been something we've been talking about for a long time. Um, it certainly is intriguing. So it's worth looking at, for sure. Councilmember Van Ness. Thank you. Um, I had some questions on the, the four elevation drawings that you didn't get to. Uh, they're on our, they're on our there. packet. Yeah, they're in there. OK. Um, the west elevation, I'm trying to figure out or even the south elevation. Uh, I see cars along, no, okay, go up one, back one slide. Okay, on the south elevation, um, I see all the little windows that must be the apartments up there on those floors. Correct. And the area where it's brownstone, um, that level of all those big windows is probably the, the commercial stuff office space and then there's dark down below that is that all open into the garage or is that another level of commercial what is that so what you're seeing here is is parking garage and so what we'll have are entries into the parking garage and also uh, probably ventilation for the parking which basically just means okay you know where does open it go area? on the right half of the building then so then as you go to the right we'll be up a slope and then and then flat again so we're, we're getting up to the street level again over there there's there's a complete one floor level change basically about 11 foot level change so, so that parking is going to go in south of that how does that approximate this building is there a driveway or a park area green area let What's me see if we can those two if we can well between between the two buildings we actually have a pedestrian path okay so Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a eight foot, a planned eight foot pedestrian pathway um, with landscaping on both sides and um, lighting, okay. um, and that's it's that's not design requirements, but it's things that we're looking at to make that actually an inviting pathway that people can use. That's good. It's really a pet design element of ours that we want to make sure that we get it right, um, and we've developed a picture profile. Uh, portfolio of uh, different implementations in similar settings uh, that we can kind of take bits and pieces and try to really make that a neat pathway. And the total width is 12 feet. Just the, the actual walkway right now is 8 feet and there's 2 feet of landscaping on either side and we've talked to staff about how maybe it's 12 feet and goes down to 8 feet with landscaping. So there's, there's, we're still working on that design. Okay, now if you could go back to the west elevation. Which was the next slide after? The Before one. you do, I do need to make a clarification on the south elevation. Uh, Deputy Mayor Van Ness, you mentioned brownstone. I oh, don't yeah. don't think that's brownstone. I think that's uh, wood siding. Okay. It's wood. We have well, material samples on the board over there. You can okay. you can look it's at brown. 
just the brown yeah, area. The brown stuff is grabbing. Okay, okay. I just didn't want there to be expectation okay. of brownstone. I don't think there's any brownstone or brick on this building, correct? No brick. Not on 68th either? No. To match the other building? No, there's no, no brick on this design. Okay. On the west elevation, could you go to that? Okay. There. Now, it's an L-shaped building, and on the right half of that illustration, I wish my pointer would go on your screen, but it doesn't. Um, the right half of that is, is what, uh, down below the brown wood section there? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's the uh, commercial area and parking underneath that. What do we see on the left side there? It's open with windows. It's that should be parking, I would think. There, right? We have a parking area. I'll, I'll point that out in the in the plan. Two levels of parking there, on top that lid, and then underneath. That's exactly right. Yeah, there's a okay. there's a level on top of the lid, and then you can go underneath, park under there, and you're you're seeing a bit of that slope again as you move from left to right. Okay. On, and your driveway is coming in on the left between the tree and the building. That's correct. Yes. Okay. You know, that west elevation um, abuts basically Kenmore Camera. Okay. And between Kenmore Camera and that bill and this building, there's an existing pathway okay. um, that Kenmore Camera uh, installed. And that pathway links Spencer 68 with um, this project as well. Okay. Good. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions? So um, just to clarify the access, so it's an L-shaped building, and there's obviously a way you can get into the back, which I'm assuming there's an entrance to the uh, commercial space from that, that direction. And then you can, from the south, you can go into the garage. So is there a way for, not that I want it to be, but is there a way for a person to um, drive their car from the back parking lot to, say, the more central parking lot in Kenmore Village? I say had not. Would they have to go through the garage? Yeah, if yeah, they if they the entered off 68th, they would have uh, a choice, and the choice would be they'd go into the upper parking area mm -hmm. that's for uh, commercial customers, or they can go down a slight hill and enter the parking garage. Okay. And once they're in the parking garage, um, they can exit into the town center area with their car. Okay. Thank you. Smith. Um, I just would like to thank you for coming out this evening, and it's nice to be able to have the architects here and the designers. So I appreciate Tony and, and uh, Sean coming out. That's nice, and um, it looks really nice. I look forward to seeing what the actual deviations are from the code. I know we don't have specifics on that for the. Uh, development agreement, but I will say it, it's what you've provided tonight is really tonight is really nice. Thank you. Thank you. Did you comment? If I could, if I could just add to Council Member Smith's uh, comment. So uh, what you'll be asked to approve on the 27th will have more detail. It'll have the, um, the site plan approval and the accompanying staff report and additional detail on exactly what deviations and the, just the description of the de deviation. So um, what is allowable height, what is actual height, um, discussion on step backs, setbacks, things like that. So you'll have that additional detail. Another thing I want to point out, uh, Kelly Price mentioned that they don't have um, the southern and the restaurant building designed yet. Those buildings are part of this development agreement. So the development agreement is going to talk about um, having them come back for your approval for those designs of those two buildings if they, in fact, need um, council approval for design um, and um, design standard uh, deviations. So the other two buildings would need to come back, most likely, for your uh, approval at a future date. Just switching hats from my city council hat to my evergreen hat. So I'm the medical director for the 10 primary care clinics that we have, and this will be one of my clinics. And I'm really looking forward to seeing it built. Great. You'll certainly have a little more elbow room to work with. 
Anything else? What about timing? When are we when are we going to get started on all this? <laughs> well, we're uh, we're planning on beginning the. Uh, there's asbestos in the existing buildings, so that all has to be abated. Uh, we plan on starting that in late July, early August, and from that things continue nonstop um, with uh, demolition of the buildings, um, site work, all the grading, utilities, uh, undergrounding of power lines that has to be done, um, the placement of dirt on the town green. Uh, all that happens simultaneously with utilities and stubbed to the north lot, the southern lot, the restaurant pad. Um, so we really button up the site, and then we go vertical almost immediately with the northern building. So it's uh, probably going to be in total an 18-month process, um, starting in late July, early August. And, and my understanding is uh, Evergreen hopes to be able to have access to the building to start their tenant improvements in early 2017? Uh, fall of 16. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's faster than I thought. Yeah. The, when, they take, uh, when they take possession for their improvements, the building won't be done, but all the life safety in their space will be complete. So we'll get them in there a little bit early so that they can open when they want to in early 17. Okay. So, I, I, hey, Rob, I have one question. One, if you don't mind, Mayor. Um, on, just to go back to what you said on the approval of the site plan for this development agreement, now it's going to have the other two parcels, but there's nothing in there that deviates from our code on those other two parcels that are inclusive in this development agreement. Is that correct? Any deviations will have to come back to us? Yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. Anything else? All right, thank you. Thank you thank very, you. very much. Thank you. Very excited you. about this. Great. Thank you, guys. And I know you're thinking about the All right. Um, Okay, uh, Sound Transit 3. Um, it's really been a great team effort among my coworkers and also uh, folks from our neighboring cities and really joining together and speaking with one voice on our needs for uh, transit facilities, uh, specifically relating to Sound Transit 3, which is um, a potential uh, ballot measure that the Sound Transit agency plans to bring to the voters in November of 2016. So if they are, is Kenmore going to be left behind or are we going to have projects um, uh, as part of that funding package that benefit Kenmore? And so under your direction, we've been working with other cities and we've been uh, getting letters of support written. Uh, we've been helping a citizen coalition form they're calling themselves 522 Transit Now with an exclamation point. And they have a website and a Facebook page. And uh, they are meeting on a fair, fairly regular basis. And they're trying to grow in numbers, headed by some, some really um, respected and well-known Kenmore residents. And so we've been in a support role there. And the mayor and I and Nancy Owsley have been meeting with Sound Transit board members. In particular, we've met with um, the East Side Sound Transit board members, which represent us on the Sound Transit board, namely um, Mayor Butler of Issaquah, Mayor Marcioni of Redmond, and Mayor Balducci of Bellevue. And all those meetings have been positive. They've been uh, they've appeared to be supportive of our project requests. And in fact, just tonight and just a few minutes ago, I forwarded you an email from 
a uh, Bellevue staff person who's putting together the east side uh, transit list of projects and it's I don't doesn't in my, at first glance it doesn't appear to be exactly perfect what we're asking for but I can tell they're listening and I have until tomorrow at five o'clock to make the corrections and um, anyway so but the list that the, the sound transit board members are proposing that I just forwarded to you uh, looks encouraging and there are they are talking about a light rail study on the 522 corridor they're talking about bus ras rapid transit um, they even do mention a parking garage in Kenmore so um, I'm excited I th I, but it, it's it's not perfect and I need to work with Chris Overlease on uh, how best to make tweaks to that list so overall it's encouraging and we are seeing some success any questions on that before I move to the next topic it's potential some of the citizens don't understand that they aren't going to get some the, a, a rail immediately that they maybe don't understand it's a study that piece yeah um, I'm not sure it's clearly understood but in our communications we do say study um, I am telling people that this is probably going to benefit their kids and their grandkids more than it's going to benefit them um, but we have to start be talking about it sometime and I think sooner is better than later and uh, so I appreciate everybody's efforts on this um, my coworkers have been spending a lot of time on it and I'm thankful for them in doing that also we're um, we've been in communications with Bastier on uh, setting up a meeting time with the new university president Dr. Mac Powell and we're starting to zero in on a time for um, us to meet him. We're also thinking about having him come to a city council meeting and introducing himself to you as well. Uh, and I think that's all I have. Okay. Comments, initiatives, questions? Councilmember Member Smith. I don't have anything to add except I would like to thank our city manager and those on the council that worked really quickly in motivating our citizens to uh, work on this uh, transit issue. I think it's really neat to see how quickly everything came together and, and it took good leadership too, and so it's appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, first of all, good meeting tonight. I certainly appreciate all the citizen comment and the uh, um, businesses uh, comment on the uh, manufacturing regulations. Uh, one thing I did notice when I was reading through uh, their, our ordinances, because um, it, 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 they streamlined you know, some of the other, other uh, ordinances, <coughs> business uh, licensing, and I got kind of a kick out of the junk wagon and junk trailer thing. I'm not sure we need that, but it was kind of funny. I can't imagine people selling rope and rags and stuff anyway. But one thing that I would like to see if we could look at a little more carefully is the uh, secondhand shops, the consignment shops. They're currently regulated like pawn shops. And if you read through it, um, there's um, some pretty burdensome requirements. Uh, one is, uh, and they're just funny how they're written, like keep a record of, in ink. It's basically to try to prevent people from s selling stolen goods. And, you know, I, I can't imagine consigning something in, you know, some household item or, or clothing and waiting a month for your, for your money would be, you know, a, a real high attractive thing for someone who is not the rightful owner of that item. Uh, so I did talk to a friend of mine who, there's a couple consignment sh stores in Kenmore, and uh, just asked her if she complied with it. And she was aware of it, and she explained how, you know, working with the chief, they did the record keeping and all that. But one of the requirements is that you have to hold on to the item for 10 days. And so obviously if you have a, you know, someone that wants to buy it, you're not going to hold on for it for 10 days. So just as an initiative, I'd like to see if there's a way we could streamline that so it would be more doable for, for a business like that. I see I would you. Certainly support that. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with the junk wagon thing. I just think that's funny. But, <laughs> but these affect real people, so. Councilman Curtis? Nothing to add. 
Uh, last week, I had uh, phone calls with Sound Transit Board members um, Tom, Tom Rasmussen and Mike O'Brien. Um, Councilmember O'Brien knew our list of asks before I even told them because he had read the letter from our legislative delegation and uh, was very familiar with them and generally supportive. Uh, Representative um, Councilmember Rasmussen was not as uh, familiar. I walked him through it. Uh, I couldn't read where he was on everything. And then I did bump into uh, Mayor Balducci again last week, and she was. We started talking. She listed off our requests off the top of her head again, also, and said that we wow. were the only city out there that she could list the requests from off the top of her head. So, wow, she thinks Good. we're doing a great job, and um, I just wanted to pass that on. So, great thank work. you, and thank you. Yeah. Nothing for me. Deputy Mayor. Um, two things. One, this morning, Lori and I, uh, Councilmember Sperry and I, went on the uh, nature walk with Linda Phillips in Swamp Creek Park. Uh, she's been doing it. This is the second year she's done it through the summer months, the second Monday of every month. A uh, very knowledgeable lady about the, the, the flora and the fauna of Swamp Creek Park. And unfortunately, most of the birds were scared away or they were too far away to hear, see, but we heard a number of them. But she had a lot of good information about the, the history of the park and stuff that I wasn't aware of and hadn't been down into the, the far northern reaches of the, of the park uh, ever. And it was, an, it was an interesting tour. So you get a chance to do it second Monday of the month. It uh, starts at 9 o'clock from the parking lot, the north parking lot off 73rd, if you get a chance to do it. Um, Eastside Transportation Partnership met last Friday. A um, uh, number of things that, that came up. We, uh, we're moving ahead with our symposium on technology and the future of transportation, and that's scheduled for October 9th. And it would be a good thing, I think, for all of us on the council to go to. Um, get it on your calendars. It's an all-day, essentially an all-day thing from 9 or 8.30 until 3.30 or something like that. Should be a good uh, a good preview of what we can look forward to in the future in terms of technology and transportation and how things are likely to be changing and how that might affect our planning uh, for the future. So I think it'd be worthwhile for those on the council and many people on the staff to attend it as well. It should be a good conference. Good people. Um, uh, the, the list of all the speakers and the program hasn't been set as yet, but they're, it's coming quick. Um, also, there was a lot of concern, well, there was concern raised by um, Kim Allen from Redmond uh, regarding uh, and, and submitted a, le a letter that, that Skateboard, the southern uh, sub-area group, uh, has submitted to Metro regarding the need for uh, park and ride facilities. And she suggested that we might want to do the same thing from uh, e uh, ETP as well. Uh, all communities have the same problems we do with park and ride lots that are full at 7.30 in the morning. And, and, uh, and we felt that it would be worthwhile if not only just individual communities are requesting more park and ride facilities from, from Metro and Sound Transit, that we do it as a group from the whole East Side Transportation Partnership, a group that represents all the cities on the East Side. So. Um, uh, there's a subcommittee that's been formed that's going to draft a, uh, a similar letter there, plus a letter to Sound Transit about uh, our desires from the east side for uh, Sound Transit ST3. And so all cities that have uh, submitted letters as we have to SC3, ST3, we've submitted those to this, uh, to this committee and we'll be putting stuff together, getting a, a group east side position for sound transit. Uh, that doesn't mean that individual cities don't need to do it. Everybody needs to fight for their own turf, but um, we're going to be doing it from the east side as well. So that's all from ETP. Thank you. A um, number of things that um, Just a little piece of information to lie for. Uh, Kenmore Fire Department did not respond to one call in Kenmore. There were none. They had helped Buffalo for 15 different calls of Buffalo fire, uh, including one structural fire and, and, uh, and then crush fire. So, uh, mm -hmm. We, uh, our band, I think, uh, certainly have a certainly do the sound 
an hour this morning. So I was very pleased with that. Um, I, I might have mentioned this, I don't know, but I was down in Olympia um, on one of the last days of the session while I've been on the transportation bill. So uh, I'm glad that that's finally done, all the work finished, and everything signed. Um, number of meetings on ST3. The latest was today was the Paul Roberts and Everett. Uh, the one thing that uh, has been very, very clear from a number of the people that I've spoken with is there's no ambiguity as to what we want. It's very clear, it's very focused, and it's, it's very thoughtful. And that's, I'm not surprised that Balfucci knew exactly what we wanted because I think everybody we, know, we have talked to, you know, Marshall needs that way. There's no, he just knows exactly what we want because we're very, very clear. Bus route to transit on 522 on 145th Street, light rail study and structured parking on 522. And it's very clear and very straightforward. So I'm very, very happy with the, with the response that we've been getting. Um, on the 30th of June, I happened to be in an event in downtown in Columbia Tower, and uh, Dow Constantine came up and talked to me and said that he drove 522. He has seen the weeds that we have been complaining about all along the Burt Gelman Trail, and he agrees that there's a number of things with traffic and that that we really need to have some projects in, in ST3. So even Dow Constantine is aware of, of what's going on. I saw the article in the paper that following Sunday mm -hmm. where he specifically called out 522. So our message is getting across. Um, I have received Okay, at permission, and I will be getting a phone call. The last piece of road deck that has been built in Kenmore will be laid in place about the middle of August, and we all have been invited to witness that. On 520 Bridge. On the 520 Bridge. Be fun. So we will have escorts from Warstock, from construction, who will walk us out on the bridge, and we can watch the last piece of roadway it's been built in Kenmore being laid in place. So I will, I will keep oh, you cool. posted on that. And I think that's pretty neat that, uh, that they're allowing us to do that. Um, the other thing is, the last item is Tukwila. Tukwila has a huge immigrant population. I don't know how many lang ang languages are spoken down there, but uh, they, the city has a cooking class program that they run for the immigrants that teaches them about foods we have in this country, how to prepare healthy meals for their kids and whatever. And I got an email from somebody in the community who had an idea and I sort of turned it around a little bit. He liked that idea, but I turned it around a little bit. We have, we have a very ethnic population here in Kenmore that I think we could learn a lot from. So I was thinking that we could have different ethnic populations present a cooking class to people in Kenmore that could learn how to fix a meal from their country. We have a great Romanian population, a Ukrainian population, and we certainly have the, the Latin, the Latino population. So I think there's a, a, a number of, of ways we could take advantage of this in small classes and uh, maybe have them at the community center. Um, so teach people how to uh, cook a meal and go down the street to 192 afterward and have a nice glass of beer. So with that, we're adjourned. <coughs>